It was still dark outside the modest, white, one-story house in Archie, Missouri. Beyond its windows' green shutters, one could only see the first hints of sunlight glowing at the horizon. It was dark inside, too, except for the dim light from a lone oil lamp. Its glow extended only a short way into the room, illuminating the pages of a Bible. The silence was broken only momentarily as the man flipped the page. He had been reading for a couple of hours now, not really paying attention to the passage of time. He had a train to catch soon, and had stayed awake reading the good book while he waited. And before this, he had calmly heated some water on the stove to wash up, put on a fresh set of clothes, and then did some writing. He sat near the bed, and on the nightstand next to it were the two letters he'd prepared. In them, he expressed how he felt he had been given an unfair lot in life since his brief stint in the state penitentiary. How he felt he couldn't properly provide for his family, and how tomorrow he was going to meet with the one responsible. He also explained how his affairs could be put in order using money owed him from those who had closed their accounts at his butcher shop before he sold it. Pleased with his writing, the letters were folded neatly and left where they could be found. After he wrote them, he walked into the next room and tucked in his daughter with her favorite doll. And then he sat down to read. Now, distantly, he could hear the low rumble of the train. It was almost time. Edward Bates Silver closed the Bible, laid it down, and stood. He let, a, let out a deep sigh and stretched, his muscles tight after sitting for too long. It had been a few hours since they had really done anything, though it had been familiar work for them and none too, none too tiring. He gathered a few things, some money, his hat, his house key, and then took one last look around. In the bed, his wife and two-year-old son lay peacefully, as they had been the entire time he had been reading just feet away. Her head was nearly unrecognizable after sustaining several blows from the axe that was now leaning in the doorway. The boy's head was split in two. In another room, his six-year-old daughter had suffered the same fate. Edward blew out the lamp, put on his hat, and left through the front door to catch his train. The lock clicked, and he disappeared, and all inside was silent again. This is Show Me Murder. Now, I gotta tell you, I wasn't sure how I was going to present this program tonight, and when I first recorded this program, I had a whole different intro written, but right before I hit record, what I just read to you occurred to me, and I gotta say, it's a, it's a good intro, right? I don't feel too, I don't feel too bad in saying that to me. It really came to me. I don't feel like I can take credit for it, so I don't feel bad in saying that. Uh, but I do want to elaborate a little bit on who I am and what I did here. And thank you, Vicki, for that kind intro. Uh, as she said, I am Michael Beer. I did work in radio news for 19 years. Had the privilege of working for Missouri Net uh, before I came here. And I think Bob is watching online tonight. Bob, pretty good friend. And uh, many of you are familiar with him and have probably seen some of his programs. So I hope I make Bob proud doing this tonight. And as, as Vicki mentioned, I did work at Missouri State, still do work at Missouri State Penitentiary giving tours and have done that for the past 10 years. And, I have to say that's really what ignited in me. I always liked history, but I don't think I realized how much I liked history until I started doing those tours. And so taking my radio background and my love of history, I wanted to do something with it. And that's where this podcast came from. Now, focusing on crimes in Missouri and history in Missouri allows me to do two things. Now, on one, pay, on one hand, it sounds limiting, right? Doing, you're only doing true crime in one state. Who's going to listen to that elsewhere in the world? But I very quickly realized that through doing this, I could cover crimes that even hardcore true crime, crime fans who have been following it for years have never heard. And I would, I would wager that 90% of true crime fans have never heard this story I'm going to bring you tonight. And I've done the Greenlees kidnapping, and I'll, I'll do James Earl Ray at some point, but I want to bring some of these new stories to people. And so I really could have done anything history. I love history, but true crime being as popular it is, as it is, I decided to focus on that. But the other thing it allows me to do I didn't want it to just be true crime for true crime's sake. I didn't want it to just be entertainment. I wanted to look at some of the social issues that these cases can shed some light on and, and start some discussions. And so with this one now, in other cases, I've looked at domestic violence issues. I've looked at mental health issues. I've looked at what I feel are some important things. And, and frankly, I can't get to all of them. I am, I am a one-man show. I can't get to everything I want to do. But in this case in particular, you're going to hear some quotes tonight from Dr. Angeline Stanislaus with the Missouri Department of Mental Health. And I want to thank her again and the Department of Mental Health for taking part in this. 
There were some letters left behind by this man you're going to hear about, and throughout my research of his story and the years that people were looking for him, numerous reporters and family and friends were asking, he must be crazy, he must be out of his mind. And so I wanted to answer that question. So I, I appreciate her taking the time and, and graciously doing an hour-long interview with me. And if you enjoy what you hear tonight, I encourage you to listen to that and hear some of that discussion. And if you enjoy the other shows uh, in my podcast, listen to some of those discussions of the issues uh, that these stories can raise. But that's a little bit about what I hope to do with this podcast. So show me a murder. You'll see that symbol when you find it online. And let's get back to the story. John Soper was a peaceful man. He was the sixth of 13 children and the first son born to the first white settlers in what today is Cass County. Now John was reportedly quite a partier in his youth, and with some writings suggesting he may have enjoyed drinking more than most. As we see here in this from the, uh, as you can see the history of play in Platte Counties, these are great resources for some of these biological insights or bit of uh, uh, autobiographical insights. And so in this case it writes, by adulthood, John was said to have, quote, reformed and become one of the most steady, quiet, and exemplary citizens of the community. He was a man of marked intelligence and great energy, and he was rapidly coming to the front as one of the representative men of the county. You hear that phrase a lot in these books to talk about people who are really up and coming in their local communities. Now, by the late 1870s, John and his wife, Sarah, had six children, some of them coming into adulthood. And he owned a farm about four miles south of Kearney, Missouri. And so if you can see Kearney up here close to the upper right corner, and then here is the Soper Farm, right down here, okay? Now he is said to have been peaceable, industrious, and mild-mannered, never speaking ill of anyone, and thought to have no enemies. And so local residents were shocked then when they found out he had at least one enemy. On January 30th of 1880, while he was out feeding his livestock some 75 yards from the family's house, those inside heard two quick gunshots. Now the family and the kids start yelling outside, Father, Father, come quick, someone is being hurt. But they got no answer. But when they went outside to investigate for themselves, they see a man pointing a pistol at the ground. He fires two more quick shots, then he takes off running into the woods. When the family ran to the scene, one by one, they cried out in anguish at seeing it was John who was being hurt. He lay on the ground covered. Uh, he lay on the ground speechless and motionless, his head and face covered in blood. The reports say John was carried into the house where he died just a few minutes later. He had been shot four times in the head. Any of those would have been a fatal wound. Searchers were sent in all directions, but the killer was not caught. The local officials gathered and prepared a petition to Governor John Phelps asking for the highest possible reward to be collected for this man that they called harmless, innocent, and unoffending. $1,200 was raised locally. That would be nearly $32,000 in today's money to go along with any sum the state could put forth. Several people were arrested for the crime, including a clock repairer and some of the Soper's neighbors. Now, they were all eventually released, save one. Thomas May, one of the neighbors, if you can read it here, that is the made property right, property right adjacent to the Soper Farm. Thomas Maid was indicted by a grand jury, but after spending about a year in jail, he was never tried. <coughs> the reward money that had been raised to be given to him, uh, there are a lot of efforts locally to give that reward money that had been raised to him and his family because of that year he had spent suffering in jail and the suffering that they had endured during that year. Now, there was some suspicion reported early on that one of John's own sons, Edward, may have had a hand in the murder, but he was shown to have an alibi. Years passed, the case became local lore, recorded in history books like the one we just saw, and it was likely that John Sober's killer would never be found. The Sober family then tried to move on. Now, John's oldest son, Samuel, studied at what today is Truman State University in Kirksville and became, quoting, one of the Missouri's most distinguished educators. Another son, Archibald, became a druggist in Kansas City. Now, it wasn't long after John was murdered that another in the family popped up in local gossip. And here it was, Edward again, in 1881. He had been briefly suspected in his father's murder. Well, now he was sent to Missouri State Penitentiary here in Jefferson City for grand larceny. He had stolen a horse and was sentenced to two years. The life at MSP was difficult for convicts in the 1800s. They were used as labor, either in building and maintaining the prison structures or as for business owners who were profiting off of their hard labor. 
In addition to poor food, worse sanitation, and what at times was brutal manual labor, corporal punishment was used for those who misbehaved, including water torture and floggings with a cat of nine tails. Now, Edward seemingly behaved himself and was released in September of 1882 under a state law allowing prisoners out after serving only three quarters of their sentence. The following year, he married Adelia Hunt. The couple had three children, though one, Samuel, died a month after his birth in 1884. Maud was born around a year later, and Gillis was born in 1888. The family lived on Soper's mother's farm for six years. By 1887, when his brother Samuel died of what was thought to be malaria, Edward was running a drugstore in Carney. The family moved to Arkansas for a few years, and then in 1890, they moved to Archie at the southern edge of Clay County. And so I did pull up a map here from Google to try and give you an idea then of the setting that we're talking about. And you can see, of course, now here we are over here. Here's Columbia Jeff City. And you've got Kansas City. Well, we started off up here. Here was Kearney, and the farm was just south of town. And so now we're talking about Archie. So here we are, we're about an hour and a half south of the Kansas City area in today's driving time. Now this little town at the time of about 270, which like so many others, was founded to be a stop on the railroad and by 1890. It had several shops, several doctors, and at least one hotel, a bank, and of course the railroad depot. When Edward came to town, he saw the need for a butcher, and so he took on that occupation. A sober and his family were welcomed to the small community. He came from a family that was well known in that part of the state, and the family made many friends. He was generally considered polite, but people noticed that he often wouldn't look another person in the eye. He also had this habit of saying, yes sir, yes sir, when completing a sentence. And so the, in some of his statements he called everyone brother. Way before that was a common practice like it is today. Now some claimed he never laughed and avoided conversation. Sober did good business in Archie. But by early the following year, it became common knowledge that he and the family were planning to move out of town. Sober arranged to sell his butcher shop, rent out his home, and began collecting on accounts that weren't paid up. On Tuesday, April 21st, 1891, he went to the town of Adrian, about 12 miles south, and returned late in the afternoon. The people who spoke to him said he expressed plans to go into the dairy business there, or maybe in Garden City. Early the next morning, he bought a train ticket, and he left for Kansas City. Now, for the rest of Wednesday, the people of Archie went about their business. The day was all but unexceptional, but neighbors noticed it was quiet around the sober home. The two young children were not seen outside laughing and playing as usual. Adelia wasn't hanging out the wash to dry or tending to the flowers and the shrubs around the home. There was no hint of any activity at all. Thursday came and went much the same. Neighbors tried knocking at the door, but there was no response. And some of the neighborhood children likely tried to call on their playmates, but when no one answered, they went about their day. And then there were the green flies that were noticed beginning to accumulate in the windows of the home. Now, finally, by Friday afternoon, the locals decided that it was time for someone to check on the Silver family. Milton Hodges, a local justice of the peace, was called upon. Approaching the home just around dusk, he knocked, and all the windows, blinds, were down. He found that one window at the rear of the home was covered by a screen. He forced it open and climbed inside. Now from this, a small storeroom, Hodges made his way into the kitchen and then into the dining room. He had expected to find that some meat had been left out as he was looking for the source of the flies and the stench that was growing stronger the further into the house that he went. The inside of the home was dark, so dark that Hodges and the two men who followed him could just see well enough to walk around objects that were on the floor and avoid walking into things. They stepped around the children's rocking chairs and a toy wagon. When they reached the sitting room in the front room, they raised a blind. The light revealed on a bed in the sitting room, six-year-old Maude laying motionless. The men didn't believe their eyes at first, but looking more closely, they saw that Maude was dead. Her head had been bashed in. The blood all around her had long since dried. As she had been rolled onto her back, Someone had folded her arms neatly, and her favorite doll was, was laying next to her on her chest. In the main bedroom, they found Adelia and Gillis, both of them also dead. Adelia's head had been obliterated by two deep cutting wounds. The two-year-old's head had been crushed like that of his sister. Blood and gore were splattered on the walls and on the ceiling, and leaning in the doorway was the apparent murder weapon, 
an axe still covered in evidence of the crime. Above the bed hung a sign that read, What is a home without a mother? On a nightstand next to the bed where the mother and the young boy lay dead were found two letters. One of those was addressed to Hodges. Imagine his reaction walking into the scene and there's a letter waiting for him. It was dated April 21st, 1891, the preceding Tuesday, and it read, M.W. Hodges, you will find enclosed with this letter a letter for the Kansas City Times. Please send it to them as I wish to have it published. My family relations have always been of the most pleasant kind. Give my wife and babies a decent rent and sell what I have to pay for the expenses. P.S. You will find a key to this house above the door outside. Also, collect what is due me from the parties here. You will find it all in my book here that he had also left behind. Then there was the letter for the Kansas City Times, which I found it a little shocking at the time, but they did publish this letter. Here's a copy of it that, and again, I want to thank the State Archives, too. I, I should have said this at the beginning. I consider it an honor and a privilege that I'm here to do this, but this is one of the many documents for this case we found in the State Archives. This comes from one of his court transcripts, but this is a copy of that letter that was found that day. It reads, is life worth living? Eight years ago, I was released from the penitentiary. Since then, my life has been a failure. For four years, I have tried to live in my native county, but continually met with reminders of my disgrace, sometimes one way and then another. I went to Arkansas, hoping to feel better, but the trouble of my disgrace followed me and has been a burden all the time. No matter how one tries to live after being in the pen, if he has a sensible nature, there is something to remind him of his disgrace and make him miserable. But I might have borne this if it had not been for another trouble. Since I came to Archie, I have attended church some and have been studying my spiritual welfare. And here he quotes from a hymn, from a hymnal, There is a time we know not when, a place we know not where, that marks the destiny of man to glory or despair. In other words, man reaches a point beyond where there is no redemption. He cannot repent if he would. This is my condition. Tell me then, is life worth living? It was only a question of time when I should leave my family forever and ever. I do not care to live any longer. And rather than leave them in this sinful world, I take their lives. I believe I am merciful, for I don't want them to suffer as I have. I'm going from here to Clay County to kill a devil that has been mainly the cause of all my trouble. Then I shall end my miserable existence. Before this reaches you, my spirit shall be wandering beyond the shores of time, across the dark Jordan of death. Now, with a bruised and bleeding heart, I bid farewell to all that is near and dear. My friends, weep not for me. Endeavor to live so that you may escape the punishment that has been my lot. Farewell. Both letters, of course, are signed, E.B. Sober. A telegraph was sent to Kansas City authorities with a description of the crime and of Sober, but he was not found there. Authorities in Clay County also looked for him based on what he said about going there to kill a devil, but he wasn't spotted there either. Now, in the days following the crime, authorities followed up leads that Sober was seen in various places in eastern Kansas. According to one, he stole a wagon and a team of horses from a brick company and abandoned them west of Kansas City, Kansas. Another said that he had breakfast in Leavenworth on the day the bodies of his family were discovered. Many suspected that Silver would go after his uncle and another man at Missouri City, as they had a hand in what got him sent to the penitentiary. A couple of papers learned about Silver's brother Archibald, a druggist in Kansas City, and they saw him out. Now Archibald learned of the murders through a local policeman, and he didn't believe the story at first, but when he did, he cried like a baby. When the reporters found him, and asked him about the story, he said he couldn't believe what Soper had done. He thought business was going well for Soper and his family in Archie. And then and, uh, Soper had always had great relations with his family, and he loved his wife dearly. And they said he must have been insane when this happened, and if he came to the door today, I quote, would avoid him as a wild beast and would at once notify the police. An article from the Kansas City Star said that the bodies of Adelia, Maud, and Gillis were so badly decomposed and bloated that they were placed in a box and burned in a cemetery near Archie, but by most accounts they were buried together in a common grave east of town. 
Now, I tried to go find this Hall Bernard Cemetery where they were buried, and sadly, locals tell me that the, the tombstones have been bulldozed into a local drainage ditch, and the bodies themselves may be under the water there. So I wasn't able to find their gravestones and visit them, but I did go to the site to pay my respects, but that's why I don't have any photos of it for you tonight. Now, some sources also say that when the bodies were removed, an additional horror was discovered. Adelia was pregnant at the time that she was killed. Investigators first looked at the possibility that she and the children had been killed Wednesday morning before Soper boarded the train, but after talking to witnesses, it seemed more likely that they had been murdered late Tuesday. Adelia and the children had not been seen, had been seen before noon that day, but not since. Now, though authorities searched for Soper in earnest, the trail went cold almost immediately. A body pulled from the Missouri River in Kansas City two months after the murders was initially thought to be him, but it was soon decided otherwise. In May 1894, an arrest was made in California of a man identified as sober, but this turned out to be a false ID. The case, again, went cold. Three more years passed. The murders of Adelia and her children, and whatever became of Edward Bates sober, seemed to be passing into legend, along with the murder of his father. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, in June of 1897, newspapers declared that sober had been caught. Those who remembered the same headlines running three years prior were likely skeptical and expected to learn it was another case of mistaken identity. But this time, the killer had been supposedly found in Oregon. He had been living under an assumed name, had remarried, and had left his wife there taking their two-year-old child, who he had also reportedly killed. Only this time, the story didn't go away. Sober had actually been found. And he was found by chance thanks to then count Jackson County Prosecutor Frank Lowe. And it all began when he saw this. Lowe was glancing over newspapers in a YMCA when he noticed this article in a Portland Evening Telegraph about a woman looking for her husband and her two-year-old child. The woman, alternately described as having been a widow or having divorced another man, said her husband had never said an unkind word to her and had typically passed all his free time at home. But one afternoon, he took the child and said he was going to see a shoemaker. He took $250 with him. She said it was normal for him to keep that kind of money on him, and he never returned. She hadn't seen him or the child since. The article referred to her as Mrs. Soper. Lowe had a brother, Sam, who was a Kansas City police officer. Now, Sam was a rookie and had been doing fairly menial jobs, often spelling other officers. Well, Frank thought Sam was meant for bigger things. It was also a chance for Sam to collect an outstanding $700 reward, almost $23,000 in today's money. So, Frank kept quiet about his theory that this missing husband was sober. He got Sam and the two main plans for the latter to go to Oregon and make the arrest. They quietly secured requisition papers from Governor Lon Vest Stevens, and away Sam went. When he arrived, he learned that Soper had been working for the Pullman Rail Car Company as a cleaner of their sleeper cars under the name Sandy Preston. He learned that after leaving Portland, Soper had gone to Oregon and eventually to Ash uh, Portland, Oregon, and eventually to Ashland, Oregon, where he had taken the name Homer Lee. Now, Soper was apparently interested in buying or had leased a fruit farm and in the process was working in irrigation ditches. Sam posed as a tramp and got a job with the same team. Once he was sure he had his man, he got a buggy and returned to the work site where he confronted Soper with a revolver. When Soper was confronted with his true identity, he said, God, to think I should be arrested after so many years. And he didn't resist and he made no attempt to hide his identity. Lowe quickly and quietly smuggled Soper through Portland to avoid local authorities making any claim to him. The two even hid in a boxcar one night until the train that would take them to Omaha set out. Lowe talked to Soper about the whereabouts of the two-year-old who he'd taken with him when he left his wife in Albina, which today is a part of Portland. She said, she said that Soper had sent her a letter saying the child named Gillis. Now, did you catch that? That's the same name as the son he had murdered back in Archie said that he had taken Gillis someplace where he would be cared for, but he told Lowe that he had thrown the boy into the Willamette River to drown. Lowe said that during their journey east, Soper would often wake from his sleep shouting, he can't swim, poor fellow. But that was the only remorse he ever showed for any of those crimes in Oregon, except for the fact that he told his wife his real name, which of course is what eventually got him caught. Now, Soper's wife, Katerina Henriette Brown Liu Prince, 
who had left with little, he had left with little or no money, had been working as a domestic servant to raise money for a reward for finding her son. When confronted with the report he had been killed, she initially didn't believe it. She told an Oregon paper, quote, he has always been such a kind husband and so good to the children. I am ill from grief alone, and if I don't get the child back, I shall die. Her aunt came to care for her and described her as nearly dead from grief. Sober told the Lowe's upon arriving in Missouri that he would write his wife about their child, and he did. My dearest Katie, I write you once more to ask you to forgive, if possible. No one can realize what I have suffered unless you do. He told her that he had buried their son and where to find him. He said, quote, it was this same old melancholy feeling that comes over me that caused this, and you know that you are talking of taking poison, as if he's trying to somehow spread guilt beyond himself. He offered to send her what money he had if she would take it. Quote, please tell me where to send the money, and then I hope to feel some better. Your loving but unworthy husband. P.S. Don't hate me, for I can't help it. Now, as with his earlier letters, Silbert here shows no remorse for his crimes and tries to paint himself as a victim, perhaps suffering from some mental issue that has led him to kill. After receiving Soper's letter, his wife went to authorities in Oregon who searched the area where he said he buried the boy, but the body was not found. They suspected this story was a lie and that the boy had indeed been thrown in the Willamette. But one man would not quit looking. Now, papers only identified him as a Dr. Kessler, but he wrote Soper again, seeking a further description of where little Gillis had been buried. Soper's reply was apparently no more clear than his first description, but Kessler kept looking. In July of 1897, nearly a month after Soper was taken from Oregon, Kessler located a mound near the mouth of a gulch, and beneath it was the body of an infant. It was identified by its clothing and its cap as being little Gillis. An investigation then revealed further horror. The doctor said it appeared Soper had attempted to strangle the child, but had only rendered him unconscious. Believing the boy was dead, he then buried him alive. The child had awakened in the shallow grave and tried to free himself before suffocating. The mother, who still had clung to belief that the boy was alive, was then crushed, unfortunately, by this news. Gillis was buried in an unmarked grave in the Lone Fir Pioneer Cemetery in Portland. Soper was secured in the Cass County Jail, where hundreds reportedly came to see him and confirmed that it was indeed him. Now, he remained in that jail until his trial, which began with the jury selection November 30th of 1897. The following day, the little town of Harrisonville was filled with spectators hoping to catch a glimpse of this man and of his trial. It appears Soper was tried only for the murder of his wife. This was likely strategic. If they somehow didn't find him guilty of this murder, they could then pursue murder trials for the two children if necessary. Soper's mother, one brother, and one sister were among those in the court to support him. His brother Archie, the one who felt feared him as he would a beast, did not come to the trial. Newspapers rightly predicted that Soper would present an insanity defense. He made a statement that on the night he was born, his father attempted to kill his mother, and therefore he was a child of crime. For about two hours on the opening day of testimony, his court-appointed attorneys put his mother, his sister, and a Cass County deputy on the stand to present testimony that he was insane and that insanity ran in his family. They testified that Soper's grandmother had been insane, as well as two of his father's cousins. Three doctors were called to testify that Soper was predisposed to insanity. And they testified that he suffered from paranoia complicated by religious delusions. Other doctors testified that he was as sane as anyone. The defense also attempted to highlight Soper's relationship with his family before the murders, saying that he had been nothing but loving and kind. They cited this as further proof that he had to have temporarily lapsed from sanity when he brutally murdered his wife and two children. Prosecutors sought to prove that Soper was always mad, and they cited his stint at MSP and his preparations to leave Archie in the days before the murder as premeditation. Sober is said to have broken down and wept bitterly when prosecutors read the letter that he had left on the nightstand next to his dead wife and son confessing to the killings. But during testimony, additional details of the night of the killing were brought to light. It was said that Sober killed his wife and children after they had gone to sleep around 11 o'clock on the night of Tuesday, April 21, 1891. After the murders, he removed his wife's ring, 
which ring was never specified, but from context it sounded like it was her wedding band. Now, he later had this ring altered by a jeweler in Oregon and went on to wear that ring from that point forward. He heated water on the stove so he could wash off his family's blood. He left that pan sitting on the stove where it was later found by Hodges who said he found clotted blood in it. Then he returned to the bedroom where his wife and son lay dead and wrote by lamplight next to their bodies, the two letters that were later found on the nightstand. After writing the letters, he said he read from the Bible until 5 a.m. when he locked up the house and went to board the train to Kansas City. They told Justice of the Peace Hodges that he didn't, quote, kill that devil in Clay County, as he had referenced in his letters, because he didn't think he had time. He only had about half an hour in Kansas City before having to catch his next train. Now, further rumblings were reported around the time of the trial that Sober's actions and mindset and, and leading up to the murder were shaped by the reports of an illegal bar being in Archie, or what was known then as a blind tiger, and that he couldn't stand living in a town where such a thing was happening. Another rumor was that he argued with his wife about her having joined the Christian church, which he sometimes attended with her and the children, and that was somehow a motive for the crime. On the morning of December 4th, and after 16 hours of deliberation, the jury found Soper guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to death. He and his mother cried and sobbed at the reading of the verdict. His execution was scheduled for February 4, 1898, but was postponed while his case was appealed to the state Supreme Court. Soper spent all of 1898 in the Cass County Jail. There's only occasional brief mentions of his time there, indicating that his only correspondent was his mother. His brothers, his sister, and his wife in Oregon would have nothing to do with him. During at least one part of that time, he was the only prisoner in the jail. He was periodically on suicide watch. At least once, he reportedly refused a visit by ministers seeking to console him. He said after people thought he was crazy over religion at the time of his murders, he was now done with it. By October, when the Supreme Court would take up his appeal, he was described as indifferent toward the outcome, having no interest in anything. His attorneys made several arguments to the Supreme Court, perhaps most notably challenging the letters he left behind at the murder scene saying that they couldn't be proven to have been from him without proof of his handwriting. Now, you might find some humor, albeit morbid, in the Supreme Court's response to this point. Um, it said, in part, that Soper had discussed the contents of the letters enough to demonstrate that he knew what they said, even though he claimed not to have read them. It continued that the letters, and here's where I'm quoting from the court, the letters confessing the perpetration of the murder of the defendant's wife and children, found on a stand in the house, near their bodies, after the homicide, and dated the day of the homicide, where written on the defendant's letterheads, signed with his name and spattered with blood, and where the defendant immediately fled from the state, are admissible without proof of the defendant's handwriting. So the court pretty soundly rejected that argument. It also rejected the argument that a person could be sane immediately before and immediately after the commission of a crime, but be temporarily insane while committing the crime. The court upheld Silver's conviction and his death sentence. In the days leading up to the hanging, there was an effort launched to have his sentence commuted. Now, I wasn't able to find the articles elaborating on the reasoning behind this effort, but the response was huge. It was denounced by hundreds who attended a meeting in Archie in which resolutions were adopted to that effect. There was even talk of hanging in effigy the former sheriff, who was one of the supporters of this clemency effort. Governor Stevens predictably declined to act uh, to block the execution. Soper said he was disappointed by this decision. His actions in the final hours of his life were described as bravado. The day before his execution, he was allowed to go to the gallows, which were set up in the basement of the then Cass County Courthouse, go up on the scaffold, and to test it. He tried out the trap and even offered suggestions to Sheriff Woolridge. Now, he told a reporter, quote, I can hardly wait for the time of the execution to come. The suspense and waiting are far worse than the execution can possibly be. He continued rejecting the efforts of ministers who sought to console him. On the morning of March 30th, 1899, Soper was taken, was up by 4.30 when he picked at his breakfast. At 5.23, he, attended, he ascended the stairs with Sheriff Woolridge, who then personally tied Soper's hands and feet and adjusted the black cap that would cover the condemned man's face. At 527, Sheriff Woolridge told him, Goodbye, Mr. Soper. May God have mercy on you. And he threw the letter. Soper fell seven feet, and his neck was broken. He was pronounced dead ten minutes later. His body was taken by one of his brothers and buried in a family cemetery near Kearney. 
Eight years after a crime that had shocked Missouri, a man who had killed his pregnant wife and three of his children and eluded authorities for six years was gone just like that, anticlimactically. But Soper's story isn't finished. Remember those letters, the ones we've talked about a little bit already, for what they revealed about the man. Now, he wrote another one. Two days before he died, Soper penned this from his jail cell. Perhaps a few good words from me at this time may be appreciated by all good people. I feel I have been wrongly persecuted. I know that the circumstances surrounding my birth and the influence under which I have labored have not been rightly understood. And I humbly trust that all right-minded people will give careful and due consideration to what I say. About the time of my conception and during the period of my gestation, my mother was laboring under the conviction of sin. Long ago, she told me about her religious experience, that she firmly believed that, that at that time, if she died in that condition, she would be forever lost. Day after day, she thought about it, and many a night she would get up and walk the floors, troubled with doubts and fears and anxiety, and suffer tortures of mind which only a sin-burdened soul can suffer. Under such conditions, I was conceived and brought into the world. With such an equipment, would any of you like to undertake the journey of life? Would you? Remember, friends, I do not blame my mother. Far from it. I feel for her only the holiest, tenderest, and most sacred love. I have tried, oh, so hard to live right and yet fail. Why has it been my lot? I don't know. I will know in a short time. Now, reader, go back to the time of my birth. Read again, and you will see that my mother's thoughts were indelibly impressed into my mind. They were burned into my brain. There the fire smoldered. And when long years afterward I passed through the same experience, the spark was ignited and the explosion came. I was lost and bewildered. In the hour of distress, I committed the overt act for which I am here today. In that hour, reason had deserted her throne and willpower was lost in mental darkness. When returning consciousness came back, I got up and staggered out into the world. I tried to mend the broken threads of life, but failed. Why have I been tortured? Why have I been driven to destruction? I know not. But God is just and merciful, and with a penitent prayer, I commit my soul to his keeping. To the people of Harrisonville and Cass Kelly, I want to say that during my confinement here, Mr. Woolridge has treated me with the kindest consideration. For him and all his family, I entertain the highest regards. I have only praise for them. I shall always regret that our friendship has been so short. To my attorneys, who so aptly and faithfully worked for me, I feel profoundly grateful. To all others who worked on my behalf, I beg to be remembered kindly. I remember all your kind words and assurances of sympathy. To those who have worked against me, I want to say, while you have erred and done wrong, while you allowed your mind to become prejudiced by a wrong motive, yet I forgive you all. I cherish no ill will. I harbor no bad thoughts. I shall say no unkind words. I sincerely pity you. And now as I am about to leave this world, I pray that God have mercy and forgive you, that it may lead you to know the truth and help you to be more merciful to your fellow human beings. Farewell, E.B. Sober. Once again, his thoughts are all about him. But what do these letters reveal about him? This is where I bring in Department of Mental Health, Dr. Angeline, uh, Dr. Angeline Stanislaus. And again, I'm so grateful for her taking the time to sit with down with me for an hour. And I pose to her the same question that so many people asked throughout the course of all these articles and his own family asked, and now I was asking more than 100 years later, was this man crazy? And so I sat down with her and I asked her this question, just based on this letters, this, these letters, this is what she had to tell me. My first question to her again was, was he crazy? She believes he was not. Quote, this man definitely did not appear to be out of touch with reality. He did not seem to be influenced by what we would call a psychotic mental state. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the crime scene as laid out, there was a lot of planning. The level of planning was very systematic, the doctor told me. She said what gripped her more than anything about Soper's story was what played out after the killings at his home in Archie. He stayed in the house. He not only washed his hands, 
but took the time to heat the water on the stove first. He sat by lamplight, penning his letters to the justice of the peace and the public, and, so he says, read the Bible. And all of this, after brutally murdering his wife and two children, and with their bodies right next to him. Typically, if people do a crime, they panic. But Mr. Soper did not show any evidence of a state of panic, she said. We're looking at a good three or four hours or longer. Now we know now it was like five or six hours or longer over the night that he was still able to have this clarity in putting together all that was needed to be done and writing it and organizing everything before he left. Now, Dr. Stanislaus said the most striking thing about Soper's letters is his desire for attention. From asking that one be printed in the Kansas City Times after the murders in Archie to writing another before he is hung as if adoring fans want to know what it is he has to say. He was seemingly ahead of his time in knowing that the public would be fascinated by serial killers such as himself. Now from the opening line of that final letter, okay, again, perhaps a few words from me at this time may be appreciated by all good people. He's playing to an audience. The need for publicity, the need that his thoughts are read by a bigger audience, and he wants to be that fascination for a lot of people, said Dr. Stanislaus. Quote, he truly believes that people want to hear from him, which most people would have thought if they truly have sense of guilt, they would actually feel, why would anybody want to hear from somebody who is repeatedly murdered? But his reality is that people are really fascinated by his, what he's done, and it's true, too. Look what we're doing tonight, right? And, and what we do in so many other formats. Most notably, perhaps, is that Soper's letters are, again, all about him. He expresses no remorse, no sadness about having murdered his family and his family members, and attempts to portray himself as persecuted and some kind of victim. He even goes to, so far as to thank those who have been kind to him, as if he wants to appear just and magnanimous. At the same time, he's trying to give the sense that he has a mental defect. But Dr. Stanislaus says he doesn't know the right words to use. There is no coherent phrasing of this. And this you see so many times when an individual is trying to do an insanity defense or something after a crime, and they want to bring a mental state element into it. But it just doesn't all flow together. This is one of those cases. Again, that's another quote from Dr. Stanislaus. She said, Sober reminds her of at least one of the condemned men she's interviewed in her career. Now, over her 20-year career, and I should have mentioned this earlier, She's spoken to men convicted and sentenced to death in Missouri and Illinois. For 20 years she's done this. And so he reminded her of one of the men she's interviewed, but Soper said one thing in his letters that she said she has never in her 20-year career encountered before. So here's her quote. He doesn't blame his wife for the children, but his explanation for killing them was to be merciful to them, which is something I have not heard in my career. I have only often heard it as in, I was angry, I was upset with them. This was not driven by anger. There doesn't seem to have been an acute explosion of emotions here, but I killed them just to be merciful. That particular sentence really stood out to me. She said it's also possible he didn't actually read the Bible after the murders at Archie, but used this and other mentions of religion in his effort to convince the public that he was this good but troubled man. Even she could not guess as to motive for any of the murders he committed. She said the only person who could answer that question was him. And given her background, she said she wished she could have interviewed this man. Now, I thought that what she had to say was fascinating. Again, if you want to find that full interview, it is with this episode on my podcast. If you thought any of this was interesting, I encourage you to listen to the whole thing. But wait, there's more. At the beginning of tonight's presentation, of course, I started off telling you about John Soper. And I told you about his murder. And I didn't come back to it until now. So you all know what I'm about to tell you, right? And I'll even pause for a second and tell the person next to you and you folks watching at home, I'll give you a second, tell the person next to you, what is it that I'm about to tell you about John Silver? Edward killed his father, right? You guessed that part. At the beginning, uh, according to an article that was carried by papers, including the Sedalia Democrat, Soper told Sheriff Woolridge that he had committed the crime. But the confession was not made public until the execution. Now, it occurred to me just the other night while I was prepping this, that's probably because they didn't want anybody to come forward and say, hold his execution while we prosecute him for this other crime. They wanted to get it over with. It's probably why this didn't come forward until that late. He said that around the age of six or seven, he developed this grudge against his father that only grew stronger as he got older. He eventually decided to kill him. 
and he thought for years about what would be the best opportunity. He knew his father fed his cattle each evening and decided that, that would be the best time. The one on the night of the murder, he finished his work early and said he would go to the literary society meeting in town. Instead of going to town, he stopped in the woods, waited for his father to come out, and then went out to it. When John turned his back, or John asked him why he hadn't gone, he said, well, the creek was too full, I couldn't cross it. When Edward, or John turned his back, Edward shot him. Edward ran to a creek, said he threw the gun into a deep hole, and then he ran to the society meeting. Not, he was late, but not late enough to arouse suspicion. So think then, too. Remember Thomas May, who sat in jail for a year with a wife and kids to feed. And this man, not only for that entire year, said nothing, but then 18 more years passed. And he said nothing, while friends and family still may have wondered about May, did he do it? Okay, so this is another person victimized by Edward Bates Sober. So he murdered five members of his own family, and you all figured out that he murdered his father, right? Did you catch the other one? Do you remember Samuel, Soper's brother, considered one of the most preeminent educators of the state? And you might remember me saying that he died of what was thought to have been malaria. He died of malaria in January. Very unusual time to contract malaria. And he also died shortly after Edward visited him. And if you remember, Edward was working as a druggist in Kearney at the time, and he had brought his brother a special prescription. Now, it is widely believed by anybody who knows the case that Edward also poisoned and murdered his brother, though he never spoke to the fact, so we can only speculate today. But you have to wonder if Edward ever took anybody else a special prescription. And that, my friends, is the story of Edward Bates Silver. Anybody have, I think we've got about 10 minutes, 15 minutes left. Did anybody have any questions about this or the podcast or anything else? Yes, sir. Did Dr. Stanislaus ever compare his state, wherever it was, to other famous uh, killers? I don't know which specifically killers she compared it to. Now, as I said, she referenced the fact that she's talked to killers in this state of Illinois for 20 years. And so I, she never told me specifically who she was comparing it to, but she had my script and therefore the letters for a good month before I spoke to her. And she spent that time not only going over it, but she did, in her, if her, only in her own mind, think about, well, this sounds like this guy I talked to, and this sounds like... And some of the input that she gave me in that interview, I mean, it was fascinating for me just to get that kind of insight. And I was thrilled to death she was willing to take the time to do it for this, you know, no-name podcast and what the heck am I doing? But it was fascinating for her to do that. So in her own mind, yes, but she didn't name to me any specific ones. And, you know, some of those guys, of course, are still in prison and their cases may be going before various courts at some times. And that's probably part of the reason why she didn't go into specific names. But as I said, she found it very reminiscent of some of the people she's talked to, except for that, that one line. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Not being a medical profession, I'm sure they have definitions of a lot of terms where she said he wasn't crazy. Mm -hmm. But for a simple person, wouldn't crazy be something so far out of the normal, good or bad, and you would define that as crazy. Mm -hmm. This so, guy seems to be a complete narcissist and with no empathy just going around killing people and apparently doesn't need much strong. So, and for the... Look at that, it's like, you're off the nuts for it, buddy. <laughs> so, may try to paraphrase for those at home who can't hear the question, but basically we're coming back to that question, right? Was he crazy? And, and, I, and I have to agree that in spite of everything this trained professional whose 20-year background tells me by her diagnosis, and so I take her word for it and I trust her. Again, by medical terms, maybe no, he wasn't crazy, but my goodness, can you, what else fits the definition of crazy than what this man did. And so I don't, I wonder too if maybe she's also got to look at through this legal lens of what would the courts consider crazy? What would they find, you know? And that was part of the reason I went to her with this question is to get that perspective as well because I talk on my tours all the time and in some of my other podcast episodes about people who were executed even in the gas chamber here at MSP and by today's standards, would they have been executed or would that have been commuted based on, on their mental state? And so I think that's part of what we have to consider, too, is was she maybe talking in as much a legal sense 
as anything else. So I have to say, all the respect in the world to Dr. Stanislaus, and, I, and I'm not, I don't have the expertise to even begin to tell her, no, I think he was crazy. But yeah, I, I, it, was a, it was a question that I was left with even, the, even after that discussion with her that, again, I hate to be a shameless plugger here, but listen to the interview for yourself and hear everything she had to say because I'm only giving you snippets of it, but you, you raise a fair point. I mean, if that's not crazy, what is? But I, I think that was part of her consideration too is the legal terms and the legal definitions that go into it. You know, we have to ask ourselves, don't we? I mean, what would happen if this same case started to play out today? You know, at any point, do you think somebody would have recognized that this man had mental health problems? And would he have already committed one or two of the murders before anybody picked up on it? I mean, if this same scenario played out today, how might it have turned out and, and would some of those lives be saved? It's, I've wondered that myself numerous times in covering this. Anybody else have any questions? Comments? Snide remarks? John Dewey, yes sir. Actually, this question comes from Facebook. It says, why do serial killers seem like such nice people and attitude and appearance some of the time? So, because I mean, like, like a bunch of the people are like, you know, sounds like community, community and whatever. So. And, and so the, you, everybody online, of course, can maybe read this question, so maybe I don't have to repeat it, but this question of, of why are serial killers perceived as such nice guys, and again, I, it's such a difficult question to answer because I think the answer varies with every one of them you talk about. And some of these guys who are, you now again, he wasn't defined as being a sociopath, and given some of what was said about him having these outbursts and not making eye contact with people, I don't think that definition, as I understand it, would apply to him. But then you have some people who are sociopaths and they are very good at appearing nice and normal and everything else, and that's part of the part of how they lure in their victims, whether it's family or somebody that they meet on the street or what have you. So I think the answer to that question really is going to vary from person to person. But that's the serial killers we don't hear about are the ones who aren't capable of doing that because they don't have multiple victims because they can't lure them in like that. And so in a way, the the question kind of comes back around and answers itself. In that. <laughs> I, I hope that I hope that helps, but that, that's a question we struggle with every time one of these guys pops up. Is there another question? Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Maybe I missed it. Uh, do, do you feel like he had any other victims that we don't know about, or the the only ones that we you know he talked about tonight? Okay. So, um, and Brian, thank you again for all the work getting this set up tonight, and participation in everything uh, in this event. And the question for those listening on home was, do I think he had any other victims? Hard for me to imagine he didn't. Um, I feel like it would have been very possible for him to have killed people on the way to Oregon or during his time there before he got involved with this woman. From what I can tell, he was only with her for, you know, that the, Gillis in Oregon was only about two years old. And so the, that other four years, he had plenty of time that he could have. And given, I mean, he got away with his father's murder for, it would have if he, if he didn't confess to it. I think it's very plausible that he did. What's interesting to me, though, about that question that I've struggled with in, in trying to decide in my own head, do I think he killed anybody else, is, of course, all of his victims were related to him. And whatever was going on in his brain, and again, we come back to that question of what kind of crazy was he, I think that had something to do with how he picked his victims. I don't know if he thought that somehow made it okay. I don't know if that made him focus more of his anger on them, but that's the only thing that gives me any pause to think, well, maybe he didn't, is because everyone he killed was in his family, and I think that had something to do with his mental state or his, I hesitate to call it psychopathy, because again, I'm not an expert, but whatever his motivation was, that's the only part that gives me any pause in saying, yes, I think he did. Anybody else? There's another question online. Did is the location of the house in RC known? Like the street, the address, is the house still there? I do know exactly where it was, and I chose not to publicize it precisely because I don't know the name, I don't know the people who live there now, and I'm sure they don't want that kind of notoriety. I can tell you that on the spot where the house stood is now, it's, a, it's basically a backyard behind another property. So there isn't a house on the spot where it stood, but I have found it on, on plat maps and on Google Maps, and I've driven by it, but I'm not. <laughs> I thought maybe out of respect to the current inhabitants, I shouldn't go any further than that. Yes, sir? Did they take photos of crime scenes in those days? You know, I, 
I don't, to answer the question as you phrased it, did they take them, I think there was some early crime scene photography going on by the late, uh, the early 1890s, but I think where you would see that would have been in the bigger cities and things like that. I'd be very surprised if photos did get taken of this scene out in Archie and in this little town where it was, but I can certainly tell you, if they did, and I, I went every avenue I could to try and find any further photos, I mean, you saw some of the imagery I had tonight, uh, if I had had them, I would have used them in some form. And let me tell you, I don't, I don't give myself too much credit as being an expert in finding these documents, but the folks I've worked with at the archives and at the local county historical society and some others, they know the places to look. And so after checking with them and checking with the, the local county courts, who everything they could find had already been destroyed, long since destroyed. So if those pictures ever existed, we certainly weren't able to find them. Now, I would question whether, again, in a case in Archie, maybe there weren't pictures taken, but there were other documents I was hoping. I was hoping to get the original letters if I was very, very lucky. But I think a lot of those things, if they ever did exist, like pictures that are long since destroyed. Yes, sir? So that is one avenue I didn't pursue in this particular case, and there are other cases I'm looking at now. The question, I'm sorry, the question was, did I find any members of the family uh, related to the Soapers and, and interview them, or maybe even some of the others involved in the case, like M.W. Hodges? And this is one case where I chose simply not to, not to follow that avenue, at least not yet. I may come back to it, but that, I have to admit, is owing to the fact that with this podcast, I'm a one-man show. And so I kind of, I, I pursue each case differently. Now there's, there's one that I'm looking at, and I don't want to get too much into de de detail here because I haven't spoken to these people yet, so I don't want to, until I talk to them and get their permission, but there's one particular case where I may have some leads on members of both the victims and the perpetrator's family in this case. So that will be an outlet I, I pursue in that case, and basically it's kind of what do I think is appropriate in any given case. So in this one, I haven't done that, at least as yet. Yes? Where's your podcast? I appreciate that question. Where's the podcast? Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest. There's a paywall on Apple, and I haven't broke that yet. So right now, it's Stitcher, uh, Spotify, uh, Pandora has picked it up, Amazon, and Google Podcasts are probably the five biggest places to find it. And I always tell people, if you can remember Missouri's The Show Me State, Show Me Murder. Uh, but uh, very easy to find if you just do a Google search. And then I also have a Facebook and an Instagram page, and I would love to hear interaction and feedback, especially if you listen to more of the episodes. I'd love to hear from you. John, did you have another question from online? There's, before? At, least, there's at least two more. One of those is, why was he not executed in the gas chamber? And you might even tie in the tours of the penitentiary with that, too. Mm -hmm. So the... One question was, why was he not executed in the gas chamber? The answer is, we didn't have a gas chamber in Missouri yet. So we're talking about his execution in, I've blurred my years together, 1898, 98, when he was executed. Anyway, Missouri didn't have a gas chamber until beginning in 19, it was completed in 1937, first used in 1938. And so Missouri didn't have a gas chamber yet is the answer to that question. But we do, uh, you, you asking me to incorporate, so we do talk extensively on the tours and even some of my other podcast episodes about kind of the history of the gas chamber and how it came to be. And basically the, the short answer to that is our state, state legislators here at the Capitol wanted to put an end to these hangings like the one I just described. Now his being in the basement of the county courthouse, it wasn't necessarily the spectacle that we think of happening in some of the other hangings that used to be done in every county in the state or whatever county the crime would be moved on a change of venue. Because his was in the courthouse, the hanging itself was relatively contained. But remember when I said the day, you know, when the trial began and people were coming into Harrisonville just to see this crazy guy or to watch his trial, and what I didn't have, maybe should have mentioned, but uh, in this hanging and every one, other one of them, I guarantee you there were people in Harrisonville that day for the hanging, even though they couldn't get in the courthouse. And they would often turn out, some, you know, sometimes thousands of people would turn up in these little towns to watch these hangings, and it was a public spectacle. And that was a term the lawmakers used when they were proposing, this is why we need to do away with this. So that's why we had the gas chamber at MSP, but we simply didn't have it for almost another 40 years after this crime happened. Yes, sir. Go ahead. You've done an excellent job of cataloging all this information. Thank you. May I ask how long did it take? <laughs> 
the question was, how long did it take me to, to put this together? That's, I, I, and I like to throw this caution out when I'm plugging my podcast because I got to tell you folks, there's only eight episodes so far because of the amount of time I put into every podcast. And the simple answer is, I wanted to do this show my way. And my way is these deep, deep, detailed dives. I love finding those little details that maybe nobody else has found, but that's where I look, that's what I really enjoy digging for. And so the, the answer to your question is, this particular case, I think I worked on for four months by the time I was done. And that's while working on other cases. So if I hit a stopping, you know, brick wall with one, I'm still working the whole time. But I probably put four months into this one. I've got one I'm getting ready to release that I worked on in, ex in excess of seven months. And so that's why there are so few episodes. Please bear with me. I will get them out there as quickly as I can. But I wanted to do it the way I wanted to do it. This, is, this was my baby. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned James Earl Ray. Yes. He was evaluated by a psychiatrist at mm -hmm. the State Hospital who lived here in Jefferson City, and he passed him on his, that, you know, it always seemed to me that was, if you look into a, a study story, James Earl Ray, mm -hmm. a lot of people have covered him, but uh, I thought that was sorry, That's the Jefferson City table. Well, we were, we were, so the question for those offline, we're basically talking about James Earl Ray and him also having been evaluated by mental health experts even here in Jefferson City. And they, as I understand, did give him a clear pass and he's fine. So uh, I think that when I do get into that case, and I'm sure I will at some point, I'm, I'm interested to see what they say. The difficult thing about that, and here I'm going to plug a different episode, is a lot of these files from their evaluations are long since gone or if they still exist, if they haven't been destroyed, especially from, say, our state mental hospitals, it's very difficult to get your hands on them unless you're a member of the family. I was very fortunate in one of the cases I'm working on now, and this is where the shameless plug comes in. I was re researching one of the guys who was executed at Missouri State Penitentiary, and lo and behold, in his appeal uh, that was filed with the Supreme Court, which again, I was reading in a room not 60 yards this direction, the state archives here, so thank them again, for providing his, his appeal and his transcript, there was his file from Fulton. And among other things, it revealed electroshock therapy being used on him and what the doctors evaluated it as having. And so every once in a while, to your point, every once in a while you get lucky. And I was very lucky in that one. So that's one that's on down the line. Did anybody else have another question? John, did you have another one from online? Well, there's one that I had that I can ask you later, but tell us what is the first episode in season two so the first episode in season two, uh, I had to do a crash course in boxing. I didn't know a lot about the sport of boxing, but if anybody here is a fan, did you know that a world heavyweight, uh, a middleweight champion was murdered in Missouri in 1910? Holding the middleweight title, I had no idea until about seven months ago I stumbled across this story of Stanley Ketchell. And in researching this case, not only did I have to learn about boxing, but maybe one of the single biggest things that I had to learn about, if you think about the racial tensions that have happened at various points in this country's history, or some might even argue they've never really stopped. But if you think about what happened around 1900, 1910, and if you're familiar with Jack Johnson, and Jack Johnson's famous fight uh, that when it was completed and he managed to retain the title, did break out in race riots, that left some, I think it was 20 some odd people in this country dead and numerous others injured. Well, Stanley Ketchell got caught up in the middle of all of this. Uh, and there were some who thought that he would be the great white hope. And I'll go ahead and say this, I don't think he wanted any part of that discussion. And he and Johnson were actually friends, but they did fight leading up to what we know today is this big fight that, that led to these race rights. So Ketchell's story, as so many of these do, went off in all these directions. I didn't expect it to, and it was, it was a, hugely fun piece to write. And so I just released that one about a month ago. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I had fun writing it. I had to learn how to not only write about, but you know, read and, and describe boxing matches. And that, that in and of itself was a blast. But uh, I hope you'll check that out and, and see what you think. And again, I think so many of these cases can open up broader discussions, which, boy, if we can't do that, then we're wasting our time, right? Did you, anybody else have a question? John, you have another one? All right. Folks, thank you so much for coming tonight. I hope you check out the podcast. I hope you do this again. Thank you.